And it looks like we are live. Give me just a few seconds here, guys, as I pull in the Facebook groups as we want to do. Get everybody in our wonderful Mile High Huddle community here on a great Friday evening. Mile High, hello, everybody in Broncos country. Welcome into another episode of the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. I am your host, Lance Sanderson, and joining me as per usual is my good friend and colleague. He is Mile High Huddle senior NFL draft analyst, the one and only Eric Trickle. And dude, it has been a whirlwind here over the last handful of days. Obviously, the quarterback pro days have been going on. The Broncos have been involved in a lot of those conversations. Obviously, you've got publishing stuff for me, publishing some stuff for yourself on the website with the new uh, with the new management system, the whole nine yards. It's been a long week, dude. How are you doing? You hanging in there? Yeah, I'm doing good. I actually got some good sleep last night, which was nice. I mean, I'm jealous. Haven't felt the best this week. Had a sick kid to start the week, mm. um, but just added on to everything. And yeah, it's been uh, it's been a crazy hectic week with everything that's been going on um, in the personal life, behind the scenes with work, uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, but things seem to be settling down a little bit. Back to getting content publishing and out. Got a one of your reports up not long before we went live. Going to get mm. one of mine up uh, a little bit after we're done. Um, mine's going to be talking about, I believe three interior offensive linemen, um, that we have, that's going to be coming up. So it's, uh, things are back to rolling and moving forward and grooving, which it's nice because we are under a month away until the NFL draft. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what's, what's the 27 days technically from the begin from the opening of the first round of the NFL draft. So four weeks away, guys, we are trudging along slowly, but surely, and we will eventually get there, but I'm starting to get excited, man. Uh, the more rumors are starting to pop around and this, I, while it's still the lying season, you can really gather a lot of information based on some press conferences and some news and notes and information that's popping out of from guys like, uh, Ian Rappaport and Adam Schefter. I know you talk to a lot of people. I've talked to some people as well, you know, as you kind of, kind of figure out, a little bit more of how these players are evaluated, how like where they could potentially go. I mean, obviously the big buzz here lately has been the, t- the top four quarterbacks are going to go in the top four picks, depending on what that order is. But it sounds, I mean, Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels are probably number one and number two, at least from the way it sounds. So then is it McCarthy or is it Drake May at three? And then who goes with that fourth pick or maybe the fifth pick overall if the Cardinals decide and, to hold on to and number who? four and take Marvin Harrison Jr.? Exactly. I mean, it could, it, I mean, it, it, all signs seeming are pointing to the Minnesota Vikings, but I mean, the Broncos are still involved. I mean, Sean Payton did say um, at the owners meetings a little bit ago that it is realistic that the Broncos could trade up to go and get a quarterback. Now, while I believe that that's more smoke screen and just speaking to the reality of the situation, I, I, that's where I kind of took those comments, but I mean, if he's saying that it's realistic that they could move up, who knows, maybe they found their guy and they're trying to work a deal. Well, I mean, it's, realistic they could move up the wording here mm-hmm. is something to pay attention realistic they could move up could yeah yeah it's of course it's realistic they could move up whether they execute it and get it done that's exactly. a whole different story and the issue is is what's going to happen with minnesota the best bet for the broncos to move up is to new england to decide we're not going to take a quarterback this year we're going to punt we're going to wait on it we're going to trade down we're going to take an offer from minnesota minnesota takes a quarterback at three and then Denver's trading, trying to trade to four because word is that the Raiders, they're kind of easing up on wanting to move up a little bit. The Saints, mm-hmm. they've kind of shifted focus to continuing to build their, or sticking with Carr for this year and just kind of punting on a quarterback at least early. So that kind of gives room for the Broncos to try to get up to the, there to four because if New England does decide to take a quarterback at three, Denver can't outbid Minnesota. No. They can't. Mm-hmm. Not even including Patrick Sertan, who probably won't – B doesn't well, what's the best way to put this? It's not that he doesn't have good value. He doesn't have as high a value as a lot of people think. And the Legeris need trade should highlight that a little bit. You have a right. receiver who, or a, cor- a corner who's coming off about to come off his rookie contract. You're going to have to pay big money to doesn't have the injury concern. So I don't, he won't get as little as Legeris need did mm-hmm. and little as relative here, but it's not like, it's not like J- he has Jalen Ramsey type value when Jalen Ramsey was traded to the Rams. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's hard to compete with the Vikings who have, who can trade four first round picks to get up if need be, because they have mm-hmm. that extra one this year and you can trade two years in advance. Right. Um, so it just makes it difficult how the things fall. It's why I don't see that it, it's realistic. They actually end up trading up, but that they, I mean, they still could. I think that ultimately is, 
when the time comes, they're on the clock at 12 and somebody else ends up making the pick. Yeah. And Chase Wellner comes in with an astute point here. He says, Eric and Lance, are you uh, concerned about the Broncos giving up capital to move up given their roster issues? Yeah, absolutely. They don't have a whole lot of capital to begin with. I mean, it would be nice. Obviously, the 12th overall pick has a lot of value here. Uh, Sertan, if they wanted to move on from him, which I don't think that they actually do, would, would be a great piece to add in that. But they don't have a second round pick. They're missing a bunch of talent right now because they haven't taken a first round draft pick in the last three years. So, yes, given the roster issues right now, trading up does give me some concern here i mean quarterback is the, the be all end all and i understand that but at the same time you can't force a quarterback into a bad situation with a bad roster around him because all you're going to do is make it harder for him to adjust to the nfl level which eventually is going to just burn him out and he's going to flame out like zach wilson or, or for name 15 other different quarterbacks in the last 10 years that were forced into bad situations where they didn't they didn't end up panning out to what they potentially could be so i while it would be nice to go and get a, a J.J. McCarthy who has some time to learn, let him, you know, learn behind Jarrett Stidham for a year, build up the rest of the, the roster a little bit, go into year two with him who still needs to learn, still needs to grow, still very raw player. I could get behind that particular guy, but anyone else, I'm, I'm like, eh, you know, just – stick with what you've got going on and build this roster right now. Take a quarterback that you kind of believe in trading down or whatever that may be, but trading as much capital as it's going to take to move up into the top five is something that doesn't necessarily appeal to my taste. I just want to point out the irony of what you said. You went on, you started that by saying that you can't force a quarterback into a bad situation. And then just said 15 other examples of quarterbacks being put into a bad situation. Teams do it all the time. Mm -hmm. Like teams will force quarterbacks into bad situations because quarterback is so coveted. It's so important. Yeah. Um, hopefully the Broncos don't do that. And that's what mm -hmm. you're getting at is that you don't want to see the Broncos to do it. They're not exactly. in the best position to be able to do that because of how messy this roster is um, or how poor this roster is, how much this roster is lacking. Already coming in with $10 from Canada. Am I the only one that thinks trading the farm for the fourth best quarterback sounds like a horrible idea? Do we really think Peyton's guy is the QB four and the other three GMs are just wrong? I don't. So, no, you're not the only one who thinks that's a horrible idea. I'm fully mm -hmm. against trading up into the top seven for one of these quarterbacks. If one falls to eight, my tune would change a little bit and depends on who it is. As for do we think really think that Peyton's guy is quarterback four and the other three GMs are wrong. No, it's just that the valuations of those quarterbacks from those different G general managers, scouting departments, the team in general mm -hmm. might be different. Mm -hmm. Quarterback one, Caleb Williams is most likely most teams quarterback one, but he may not be everybody's. Some may have Jane Daniels as quarterback one. Others may have Drake may others may have JJ McCarthy. It's like receive. It's like the big conversation going on at receiver right now. Mm -hmm. There are teams who have Malik neighbors as number one. Most teams have Marvin Harrison Jr. number one, and he's expected to be the first wide receiver drafted. And Roma Dunze has some teams as him have him as a number one. Different teams, different processes, different things that they're they really covet from the different from the different players that lead to different valuations. Right, I'm with you on that one. The thing that the thing that I kind of have a, an issue with here is that fourth best quarterback sound like, yes, it, is it the fourth best quarterback on our board, on your board, on whoever's board? I mean, Sean Payton could love J.J. McCarthy as quarterback two in this class. And if he falls to number four, then there you go. That, that was his guy. He said, yes. I, was he the fourth quarterback taken? Sure. I mean, yes, absolutely. That is a factual statement. But at the same time, if Sean Payton identifies that guy, it's not saying that GMs are wrong. It's just that his opinion of JJ McCarthy was a lot higher than everybody else's was for for what that's worth. Especially because you know you don't know. I mean, what that what that board actually looks like, and you don't know what the what their evaluation process was. We can have our own opinions, but the the teams obviously have their own as well, and their opinions are the only ones that matters. Uh, we got David back, uh, Papa Bear McElrath jumping in here, five dollar super chat saying, "Good evening, Broncos country." Lance, Eric, Dylan, and Deacon Scott. Hashtag Buckham with a B three times. Uh, hashtag MHH for life, hashtag Denver Broncos for life. Um, I think, Eric, this is a good time so we can segue off this. But before we get started with our overall conversation, Eric did a mock draft behind the scenes. We're going to run through that and kind of break down the players that we've got. Before we get started with that, we do got to give a shout out to a tonight's supporting sponsor of the show. So AG1, guys, the older you get, the more seriously you know you have to take care of your health and your nutrition. 
3G1. No matter what you guys do for a living, it can become all too convenient to rely on coffee, caffeine, energy drinks, stuff like that. But that's not great for your body, especially your blood pressure. There's always the dreaded uh, crash with caffeine. And with AG1, you get sustained energy. So you're not reaching for another cup of coffee or another energy drink in the afternoon. And on top of that, we all know that you can't stand swallowing those horse pill sized vitamins. Uh, recently, we've learned how important it is to take care of your gut health. And AG1 kills all three of those birds with one stone. It does so in an impressive life altering fashion, improved gut health, focus, energy, and nutrition, all in one awesome, delicious smoothie. AG1 is next level. AG1 is a supplement many people trust to support their whole body health and help them feel their best. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs when you first subscribe. Go to drinkag1.com slash huddle. That is drinkag1.com slash huddle and check it out. Yeah, guys. Uh, thank you, AG1, for joining us. We appreciate your support as always. And guys, check out ag1.com. Eric, we've got to address this mock draft that you did. I wish we had a graphic to pull it up for you guys, but unfortunately we don't. Um, however, something that has been done over the last, well, really the, the one guy that the Broncos have been uh, like really related to in terms of this quarterback draft, this quarterback conversation is Bo Nix at number 12. Real but, quick, yeah. I, I just want clar clarification here, string guy. What are you not agreeing me with me about on this? The Chiefs did move up. I can't remember if it was from 27 or where, but they did move up for Patrick Mahomes. I know that uh, it was worth it for the Chiefs, but the Chiefs were in a very different position. They were a good team with a good roster that was led by Alex Smith, that they were in a position where they could afford to move up for Patrick Mahomes. So I'm not sure exactly where you're disagreeing me with, and situations obviously matter. Every team, every situation is vastly different from another. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't hear anything that you said there. I broke up really bad for some reason on my end. I do apologize for that, but um, I'm sure that you had some really good things to say, which is unfortunate because I wanted to kind of pine in on that. It was a, a great comment there. Um, anyways, trying to pull up this uh, the graphic that you sent to me for the uh, the mock draft, and like I was trying to say here, uh, the Broncos have been highly, highly linked to the – um, to the Bo Nix conversation, 12 overall. Um, I know that that's something that you think is a possibility, but I think that it's a better possibility for the Broncos to trade down. We kind of talked about that last week a little bit. Um, in this particular mock draft exercise, you did that. You did likely have a possibility. And like I said, last week, about 60%, I'm like projecting they're going to move down. In your opinion, is that something that they're more likely to do? Yeah, I mean, I've been very outspoken. I don't think the Broncos are picking at 12. If they end up moving up, they end up moving up. I think that's more likely that they move down um, and just, you know, add some additional draft picks to it while they try to improve the depth and improve the overall state of the roster with the restrictions that they have dealing with the contract of all the dead money that they're eating from Russell Wilson's contract. So I did move down in my mock draft. I actually moved down twice. Um, I moved down, I traded with the Miami Dolphins, I traded from 12 to 21, and then I traded again from 21 down all the way to number 38. Uh, got a couple future uh, picks in both of those moves down, as well as an additional pick in each of the, uh, an additional pick this year as well, uh, and from both of those trades, ending up picking Bo Nix at number 38 overall. One of the things that I look at before I trade down and stuff like that is obviously the big thing is, do you risk losing that player that you want? One, I don't mm -hmm. think that Bo Nix has a value of 12th overall. So obviously when I'm doing this, and this to be clear, this isn't a predictive mock. This isn't exactly what I think the Broncos will do. It is what I would do in their situation. Um, yeah. if, I, if I was in charge kind of mock draft. Um, right. I don't see a team after 12, after the Broncos pick at 12, that is at risk of taking Bo Nix. The teams that have been linked with quarterbacks have been linked with other quarterbacks, not Bo Nix, or other teams that have been linked with quarterbacks seem to have been suggesting that they're going to be moving over or continuing with their current quarterback, like Derek Carr or Matthew Stafford for this year, and then reevaluate prior to next year's draft. So I felt com I felt comfortable in trading down and allowing the board to fall a little bit and still land Bo Nix at uh, 38 overall. 
and picking up future picks. Right. Future and, picks. Yeah. And, yeah, that's that's the big thing here is is adding future picks. If you can get a second round pick in this draft, which you actually managed to be able to do uh, a couple of them. Uh, but if you if you look at the draft board, and this is something that's a very interesting part of the discourse between Michael Penix Jr. and with Bo Nix as well. I mean, when you're sitting at number 12 overall for the Broncos, what are the teams behind you looking at in terms of if they're going to go for the quarterback? Yeah, Las Vegas, the, the Raiders, they might take Penix or Nix at number 13 overall. That's one team that could potentially do that, but I don't think that they're going to do that. I think they're going to maybe try to trade down as well. You just said New Orleans is probably not a team that's interested in moving in moving on from a quarterback, Derek Carr, right now. And they're just going to try to build that roster. I mean, the Rams are a potential possibility, but they just brought in Jimmy Garoppolo. Um, you've got Pittsburgh with Russell Wilson and Justin Fields. Miami's going to extend to a Philadelphia's got Jalen Hurts, Minnesota. Um, they're probably moving up to go and get a quarterback. So they're not going to take Mo Bo Nix at 23. Dallas is in with Dak Prescott. Green Bay has J Jordan Love. Like the list goes on and on and on. The next best threat that could potentially take a, a quarterback after the Broncos pick at number 12 overall is either Atlanta at 43, but they're all in on Kirk Cousins, and then the New York Giants at number 47. And that's if they miss on one of the big four quarterbacks at number six overall. Like there's a long list of teams that are not going to be looking at quarterback, and the Broncos could realistically move down and still be able to land, whether it's Penix or Bo Nix, one of those two guys between picks number 12 and number 40. So I like the idea. The line of thinking here makes a lot of sense to me, and it's my preferred option if the Broncos were to take a player like Bo Nix at number 12 or it, it, with their first overall pick. Um, you've been a little bit more vocal about Nix. And his, go ahead, go ahead. I, I'm going to move this next question, and we're going to move on to the next pick. One of the things also is that teams moving up, and that's why I was comfortable moving down to 38. You mentioned the New York Giants. That's the next team that I can – that are, have been linked with Bo Nix specifically, and they're picking there at 47. I may have pushed it a little bit with them trying to get up, but with the status of their roster with where they're at, I don't see how they can get up that high for it. Um, and then BK coming in saying, mentioned the Seahawks, the Raiders, and the Saints. All the word is, is that the Saints are continuing to build around Derek Carr for this year um, due to the, his contract. The Raiders are basically all in on Michael Penix and they've been linked with wanting to move down. One of their best um, uh, beat guys has been talking a lot about them moving down and out of the first round and landing Penix and the Seahawks. They're building the roster around Geno Smith and sticking with Sam Howell as the backup. They were linked heavily with Michael Penix prior to trading for Sam Howell, but that's their quarterbacks. That's the way that they're going to be rolling at least this year. Mm -hmm. um, Giants could draft a quarterback. They're picking at six overall. Yeah, and if they miss that one of the top four quarterbacks, they're like, they're they all word is that they really like Malik neighbors there and then they pick again at 47. So it's, you, yep. you have to factor in all these aspects to it. That's what I was doing with my mock draft uh, when I was building it. And that's why, again, why I was comfortable moving down until twice to get to 38 and still taking bonex. Yeah. And like, Mike Woodward jumps in saying, I see the Giants trading back. That roster is a mess. And it's the top four quarterbacks do go off the board and they feel comfortable enough with a guy like uh, Malik Neighbors or a Romo Dunze. It wouldn't surprise me to see a team I that's looking that. for a tackle. Well, just uh, this thought is my, my, the, just to throw the situation out there more than anything. Um, it would like a team to move up in front of the, the Tennessee Titans for a tackle like Joe Alt. That, that wouldn't surprise me to see that protect. I don't think that's a huge possibility, but it wouldn't surprise me to see something like that if they want to move back down, uh, get gain another second round pick or something like that, um, and then take a, a guy like a Romo Dunes, they say, at um, what, 11? It, or I don't know. Really it wouldn't be there. It would be, uh, well, shoot, I, now I can't even think off the top of my head who would we want <laughs> to do something like so that. So I, mean, I, you're, mentioned, you're, you're I mentioned talking, earlier, I mentioned earlier about teams having Malik Neighbors wide receiver one. Word mm -hmm. is that's the Giants, and yeah, the word and has consistently the Giants want one of those top four quarterbacks, or they want a receiver. That's been consistently, right. and word and obviously things can change. Like that is one thing that's always with this information. Ten minutes ago is ten minutes old. Um, things change. Things are always fluid and all that stuff like that. So a lot of what I'm saying, a lot of this information that I've been gathering and am sharing, obviously can change. Giants can have a complete flip. But they're also ran by a general manager who doesn't like to trade down, mm -hmm. doesn't like to trade hardly at all. Yeah. Um, so I just have a hard time seeing the Giants being one of those teams trading. 
uh, trading down and ju- instead just taking it. It seems that uh, the Falcons at eight, they're a team that's been linked with trading down. Uh, the Bears at nine possibly could, depending on what receivers are left there, based, mm-hmm. again, off of what's going around. Tennessee Titans seem pretty set on staying at seven and taking the best tackle that's left. So four, five, eight, nine, and maybe 10 mm-hmm. as teams that could potentially move down. Yeah. All right. Back to the next quickly on this, because I really want to get through the rest of this mock draft. I got a couple of really good questions lined up for you here in just a minute. Um, something with Bo Nix is, is that everyone's like, well, he's Drew Brees, it was more athletic Drew Brees. Eh, that's not quite true, guys. Let's let's pump the brakes here a little bit. But you've said multiple times behind the scenes um, to me um, in multiple different group chats. And I think you've also done it um, on your Twitter account as well that, yeah, Nix fits. But is he the ideal fit for this for this Broncos team right now if, of, if they were to take him does he fit Sean Payton's offense as good as everybody thinks he does so no and it's not I'm not saying he's a bad fit and I, I there's a lot of people that have come at me saying that I'm saying that Nix is a terrible fit for Sean Payton and that's not at all what I'm saying he's not an ideal fit and it doesn't mean that he it's not a bad enough fit to where you can't work around it but the big thing that comes back to with Bo Nix is the arm talent with him. And because Sean Payton, his Gulf Coast offense variation that he runs, mm-hmm. utilizes and capitalizes on some tighter winder throws that Bo Nix may not have the arm strength to consistently exploit and then have those deep shots um, down the field to kind of mix it up a little bit. Mm-hmm. So not an ideal fit doesn't mean it's a bad fit. And the question is, is when you want, when you're taking a quarterback, obviously traits matter. Traits are the big thing, especially when you're drafting early Um, quarterbacks. You want guys who can be more scheme versatile. That's another thing. Mm -hmm. And you don't get that with Bo Nix. He's not a guy that you can put into any scheme and have him be successful. Mm -hmm. There's a very few schemes that he can be successful. I think he could thrive in a West coast variation and a Gulf coast variation. He could be fine, but he it's just a thing of at 12 with what he what he brings and everything like that and the traits it just doesn't match up with the value when you have to work around these other issues especially when sean payton has made it clear he wants a quarterback that he can fully that can fully run his offense fully run his offense yep yeah, that's a, that's a great way to put that. One of these days, we're gonna, we're going to need to run through the differences of the West Coast offense and the Gulf Coast offense, and just kind of the the splits off and differences between that, because I think that there's some misunderstanding, especially on my end. There's some different things that I'm not quite sure the intricacies uh, about. So one of these days, I'd like to run through with that. I can you. give a very simple. I can give a very simplified explanation of the differences. Okay, go ahead. West Coast offense, you're splitting the field in half, either left or right. And then Gulf Coast offense, you're basically shrinking the field to the middle of the field. Mm, gotcha. Okay. That's a, that's, that's, a, a pretty... that's a very simplified explanation of it. And taking them both offenses to their very basic forms of it. Right. Um, but that, that's a just a quick, easy explanation. Right. And that's that's a big reason why Sean Payton wants you to be able to process and throw with timing, anticipation, and touch over the middle of the field then. So that, that math definitely checks there. Uh, moving on to your second round pick. Uh, this is one that you got in the trade, I believe. I'm trying to read this here. With the, the Miami Dolphins pick number 55 overall, you have them taking one of your dudes, actually. Uh, Marshawn mm-hmm. Neeland, the edge rusher from Western Michigan. Um We've said it, I don't know how many different times, the Broncos need to find a true Batman at the edge. And obviously, Neyland has a, is very, very talented. First off, I'm going to let you pound the table for your dude and let us know what makes him special. And then I want to ask about the, the edge rotation a little bit coming out of that. So Marcus Neyland, I mean, when you watch him, a lot of people I, a lot of people I talk to are like, he's not that great of an athlete. Well, that conversation can end. Yes. Uh, 954 uh, RAS, relative athletic score. You can see the athleticism there at times on tape. It is an issue of that he doesn't utilize it consistently, which mm-hmm. is something that you got to work around with. He's more fluid of a mover than people think, but he's definitely mm-hmm. a strong power rusher that's going to work more so through blockers and uh, than around them. And he is probably the best run defender of this class. Like it, his run defense is exceptional. Um, and I almost didn't make this pick because he is a guy that I think would be off the board at this point. Okay, he's a guy that I've been hearing a lot of late round one considerations for um early round two so i think he's a guy that can end up going a lot higher than people expect um there's a he's a solid has a solid arsenal and developed already both of initial moves and his counters and he does well string them together 
does need to develop a more consistent pass rush plan that evolves that can evolve between you know the second and third move because typically you know you have your initial move you have your counter and then with marcus uh with Neyland, that that's kind of it he, he kind of stalls you want mm-hmm. okay now throw another counter now throw another counter keep it going keep chaining moves together and that's right. one of the big issues that he does bring Right, and that's that's something what I like about Laya Tulatu out of UCLA so much, especially for the Broncos. If they can't trade down and go get um, Knicks later in the in the draft, uh, Laya Tulatu, p- preferably in a trade down scenario as well, is a guy that I really like because of, of his pass rush refinement. I mean, he's not the best run defender, but he's capable and just pairing those moves together. Back to the Broncos though. Here, how does the rotation look like with Neyland's addition? Like, because. You say he's the best run defender in this class at the edge position, and the Broncos, they struggle at the edge. I mean, Jonathan Cooper is capable, but he, he's more just a guy. Baron Browning, Nick Benito, neither one of those guys are great against the run. How does this rotation look? Is Neyland that Batman the Broncos are looking for? I don't think he's a Batman, um, unfortunately, but I think he's the kind of Robin that you can go and sit there and continue to be effective with, with your pass rush and run mm-hmm. defense with the rotation um, and end up having a really good room. Uh, he pr- brings a lot of what the Broncos don't have. They have a lot of finesse rushers, mm-hmm. uh, so they, they they don't have that power at that position, and that that they don't have the run defense there. Jonathan Cooper is so inconsistent against the run that while he's shown technical improvements, there are size limitations that end up get, leading to him getting swallowed by blocks, being unable to hold his own at the edge, and all these other issues. And uh, Neyland, he can help cover those issues a little bit. And also one thing too that a lot of people forget about this edge room. Browning and Cooper, final year of their deals. Yeah, are they both? Ex- are that you going to extend them both? Edge is a position that you typically want to address before it is actually a need. So Marcus Neyland, even if he's not a starter as a rookie, well, guess what? You have somebody where you're not forced to pay out big money, possibly mm-hmm. to Baron Browning or, and Jonathan Cooper uh, after this year to keep your edge room going or having to throw a rookie out there. Right. Well, and it, like you said, going into year four for Cooper and for Baron Browning, but this room is still young as a whole. I mean, Baron Browning missed a lot of time with injuries and he's, that's been something we haven't really seen the true development side. I, I, I really like the potential there. Cooper, like I said, more just a guy quality rotational plug and play kind of a player. But for the most part, there's not a whole lot of experience in this room. Nick Benito's going into year three. Do the Broncos need to go out and address the, the edge room, even maybe towards like closer towards training camp, bring in a veteran guy to help round the room out a little bit and offer a little bit of, of experience or do you trust in the development of these young players to really round this room out and be comfortable moving into the season this year? So I think the need for veterans, especially at certain positions can be very overrated mm-hmm. edge. It is handy. I don't think it's a must to have because there are tips and tricks that you learn throughout working in the NFL that can help you with your pass rush that you just don't always, that takes some time for you to just get that is one thing with DeMarcus Ware that he really helped Von Miller with. Plenty of experience. DeMarcus Ware, you know, he faced a lot of these tackles. He knows a lot of these little issues or hiccups that they have in their techniques and stuff like that, and he was able to pass it on. So I do think that a veteran is useful in that, in that regards with this edge room that is young, still growing, and still developing. But I still don't think that it's a must-have to sit there and get these guys to develop as players, if that makes sense. No, that, that, that makes sense. It's a, it's a fair point. I just... I think that with with the room as a whole, I mean, if you're bringing in Marshawn Nealon as well, you're adding a rookie into a room with a third year player who's been a rotational player at best. Uh, Jonathan Cooper, who's been solid, but Baron Browning has missed a whole lot of time. There's not a whole lot of experience out there. And I think that that's something that I would like to see this team add a little bit. And it, I'm not saying it's a high priority kind of thing, but something, just another player to help round out the room. Obviously, Thomas Incombe has got a little bit of experience late last season, but an undrafted rookie free agent that comes in, you're not really banking on that guy to be a real true guy. So maybe a, a value veteran signing might be something the Broncos should look at. That's just my opinion here. Uh, Phil McLaughlin, jumping in here as he's wont to do on a great Friday evening and every single show. Thank you, Phil, for joining us. We appreciate you. Good, sir. Good evening, Lance, Eric, and Deacon Scott. What do you guys think about signing Josh Reynolds, the wide receiver that was formerly with the Detroit Lions? Hashtag Buckham, hashtag MHH for life, hashtag go Broncos. Um, Eric, we got done talking a little bit about the Broncos potentially trading up to go for a quarterback in this class. I'm not going to say that he adds a whole lot of value here, but I do think that Josh Reynolds does make it a little bit more comfortable for you to incorporate a Cortland Sutton into a trade package if you did want to 
add a player to the fold. And if you're talking to the Arizona Cardinals, maybe they are valuing a wide receiver with a big body on the outside that happens to be a good contested catch receiver. And that's something that they kind of value right now. I'm not saying it's likely, but that's my initial thoughts. What do you think? I think that what they've done with their receiver room signifies that they don't want to do a whole lot of change-ups with it for whichever quarterback ends up being the starter this year, whether it's in moving up and landing one, moving down, landing one, picking one at 12 if one falls or they just decided to take one there, or if they don't take a quarterback at all and just sign another veteran like Ryan Tannehill or something. It seems like that they want to keep their wide receiver room mostly intact. Um, well, the guarantee that Cortland Sutton that uh, that was hit uh, two weeks ago, I think it was. Yeah. Um, it wasn't a big guarantee to guarantee him on a roster, but it definitely makes it a little bit harder for Denver to swallow moving him, especially with the other dead, the dead cap that they already have. Plus, Josh Reynolds, what has he done to really – how can you trust Marvin Mims taking a step forward um, uh, that he has to take? Because uh, his year last year on offense was lackluster. Tim mm -hmm. Patrick to stay healthy. Josh Reynolds, who's been wide receiver three multiple times and does well in it, uh, trust him in a bigger role. Like, how can you have all that trust in these receivers to where you're comf comfortable moving Cortland Sutton? I don't see it. I do like the signing of Josh Reynolds. I want to see the contract breakdown because um, the APY currently is the 36th highest, which is a bit much in my opinion, but it's up to 14 million. That includes bonuses. Got to see how it's all structured and everything to really get down. Mm -hmm. I like the signing. I don't love it. I, I I liked it originally when I first, the, just the basic, hey, the Broncos are signing Josh Reynolds. Hey, there's another receiver to help round out the room. That makes a lot of sense. And then we see the up to 14 million on a seven, 7 million per year average basis. I'm like, hmm, okay, let's, uh, let's pump our role. But, Pump the brakes a little bit here. Um, value signing, I think, if the if the, the contract matches up right, uh, good player. I do like Josh Reynolds. I do think he brings some fire to the position. So that's some, and it's something that uh, Sean Payton likes, especially players that go out and block in the running game. Like that's that's a big value for Sean Payton offenses. And Reynolds is a quality blocker, so I think that he's going to bring some just some again another veteran presence, a player that has some upside to him that hasn't really hit his ceiling. I don't think. Um, but, uh, yeah, just a, just a good addition to, to round out the room back to your, uh, to your draft. The one that you just did. Um, let me see here. Where am I at? I'm losing my spot. Blake All Fisher. Right, so, uh, gotcha. Uh, yeah. The Blake Fisher pick. So every, every week guys, we talk about the holes this team has the potential of losing Garrett Bowles in the, in the future. Obviously the left tackle position is going to open up a gigantic and massive hole here with your next pick. I believe it is, um, pick 76. Uh, you have Blake Fisher, the tackle out of Notre Dame. Uh, primarily a right tackle player because obviously Joe Alt exists and is one of the best pros uh, prospects in this class. Is Fisher a guy that can flip to the left side and potentially start, or is this more of an insurance policy for Mike McGlinchey? So here's a question for you. Who do you think was the higher rated pro uh, prospect uh, recruit coming into the uh, college? It was Blake, it was Blake Fisher. Fisher. Yep. It was, it was yep. Blake Fisher. Yep. He was actually, he was initially brought in to be their left tackle, but Joe Alt, showed a lot of improvement there right away. Blake Fisher struggled a little bit, so it landed him on the right side while playing opposite bookend to Joe Alt. He can play left tackle. He can be. He can make that change. He has not had an issue with it, and he practiced there quite a bit at Notre Dame, even though he was a starter on the right side. They, he still practiced on the left side quite a bit with the number two unit. Um, in uh, It's primarily in spring practices, but still. So he's got he's got not game experience there outside of I think like thirty snaps or so in twenty twenty one. So he he's been able to play there. He's shown he can switch sides at the combine. You know they run these drills and they have you do different do it one with it from a right side technique and then once from a left side technique. And he was probably one of the best the cleanest ones with switching it up like that. Mm -hmm. um, he's the guy that fits in exactly with what the Broncos could use. He can be a swing developmental tackle right away, being able to play either sides, be that number three tackle who can eventually be a starter year in year two. If you do lose Garrett Bowles, or if you decide to say, well, screw it, we're moving on from Mike McGlinchey, even though the restructure of his deal makes it a little bit harder with the dead money, but mm -hmm. the Broncos are projected to have over a hundred million dollars in cap. So they can eat afford to eat that dead money and then they can have Blake Fisher start there. So it gives them options. I think that it's more likely that he ends up on the left side replacing Garrett Bowles and McGlinchey, but he gives you those kinds of options that you like to have while giving you at a depth this year and, you know, 
time to develop under a coach who one year with seeing what he's done with some of the guys on the offensive line mm-hmm. Wood Cushenberry, I have some confidence in Zach Schaaf's ability to develop offensive linemen. Yeah. And if you talk about tools and trades, I mean, Blake Fisher at the combine, six foot six, 310 pounds, 34 and three eighths inch arms with 10 inch hands. I mean, that's, that's trait. That's, that's tools to work with there. He's got good feet. He's a good athlete uh, based on his testing as well. So um, a high upside pick. Why am I playing my ear all of a sudden? I'm sorry about that guys. GLP jumping in here with a $10 super chat. Hey, Lance and Eric, always love your show. Do you guys want Bo Nix? Go Broncos. Um, how do I say this in the right way? Because it's going to sound negative, but I don't necessarily want it to be like that. I would be okay with Bo Nix. And I, Eric, you and I kind of talked about this a little bit. It's like, just trust Sean Payton in the process. Eh, let's, let's, if Sean Payton is comfortable with him, then I guess you have to be comfortable. I'm not excited by Bo Nix. I'm really not. Um, I, I think he's a fine player, but I don't think he's going to turn into that high-end starting upside. You're talking a middle-of-the-road quarterback at best. It, like he's not going to drag you to championship victories. Like it might be able to get you to the playoffs if he, if he develops, but at 24 years old, he's grown a little bit. There's not a whole lot more for a ceiling there. So it's not that I don't want Bo, but it's I don't want Bo, if that makes sense. It depends on where. I'm fine with I'm with what Bo Nix brings. I'm fine with him at a certain point. Not fine with him at 12 because I don't think he brings enough to be that 12th overall pick, to have that investment of in him as a quarterback, yep. to be that quarter, that franchise quarterback, especially in the division the Broncos are in. I have a hard time seeing him go toe to toe twice a year against Justin Herbert and twice a year against Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. It's this quarterback is it, the uh, division is going to be ridiculous. And I mean, not that, Gardner Minshew is a barn burner by any stretch of the imagination, but he is an upgrade over Aiden O'Connell and that Raiders team is fiery, man. They're going to be tough to beat. They they've got some ammo to really kind of help rebuild that roster. And especially on the defensive side of the football, if they can get better, man, they can, they can be pretty dangerous. I'm not going to say like a a Super Bowl contender, but they could compete for the playoffs next season for sure. Um, They're in a better spot than the Broncos are. I think I don't think that's necessarily debatable. Given their their draft capital and what they have in terms of tools and pieces on the roster, the, the Broncos are in a bad spot right now. And Nix is not a guy to drag you through the the mud that is the AFC West right now. He's just not. He's not. He's not a horse like that. Uh, Michael Ronquillo jumping in here as he always wants to do on every single show, morning, afternoon, evening does not matter whether it's Monday through Sunday. This dude is one of the best Mount uh, Mount Rushmore guys on the Mile Mile High Huddle. Um, podcast community supporters. Sorry about that. Good evening, Lance and Eric on the Dove Valley Deep Divers. Go Broncos. A little late, Michael, but that's okay. Thank you for joining us, man. We definitely appreciate your support as always, dude. It's, it's always good to have you here in the chat. Uh, back to the mock draft here. What What did I say? What did I do? It wasn't anything you said. Um, okay. BK, correlation, causation. Those were strong classes that you put in. Just the fact that they didn't pan out in the NFL doesn't make that they weren't strong c- classes. Okay, I'm 2021, that was a strong quarterback class. The quarterbacks just didn't pan out in the NFL. That is one big, significant misconception that's always made. Strong class means that these players are all going to be great. No, it doesn't. It just means that they're no. good prospects, great prospects, who still may or may not work out in the NFL because there is so much that goes into being a success in the NFL. Right. Yeah, it... We just got done with the 2021 NFL draft class with, you know, Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Mac Jones. That's five guys all drafted in the top 15 picks. And right now, only one of them looks to be a middle of the road starter. And that's Trevor Lawrence. We really need to see a big jump from him. But Zach Wilson, probably going to be traded. Trey Lance already traded, has started three games at the NFL level through injuries and just needing to grow as a prospect. Yeah, they Justin Fields, yeah Justin Fields traded Mac Jones traded to be the backup behind Trevor Lawrence. Like it just because it's a strong class at, at this particular point, doesn't mean it's going to be a strong class throughout. And that's the concerns that I have with the, with guys like Penix and Knicks right now. It's like, yes, they're, they're toolsy. They're fun. They're, they're, they're great players. I mean, they're a hell of a lot better football player than I am, but are they going to be great NFL players? Hard to, hard to predict. Yes. On that particular answer. Uh, back to our draft here. Uh, 
your next pick was Jarvis Brownlee Jr. And I love this player. I love the fit. I mean, he's tough. He's physical. He's great in press coverage. He fits Joseph's defense so well in terms of what he wants to do, press man coverage at the line of scrimmage. We've gone over him a handful of times here lately, though, like we did the big thing with him and Kyrie Jackson a couple weeks ago. So I want to pick your brain on other prospects in this particular area that fit the bill as press coverage cornerbacks that the Broncos could be interested in because – not really to do like prospect fatigue, but just to get some other names out there and open up the conversation a little bit. So I took Brownlee largely because I, I, at this point, I really wanted a corner um, corner. I think is a bigger need than people think not being able to see Riley Moss out there on the field last year yep. uh, definitely has a impact on it. I have, I looked at six other corners that I have graded right around Brownlee, three of them higher, three of them lower. So there's Josh Newton, who he's got inside outside versatility, but I think he's yep. more uh, more uh, zone co- uh, zone corner. I also yep. think that he brings conditional physicality, and what I mean by that is that he'll be physical at times in coverage, but you don't see it always against the run. Uh, so the conditions are based on what is he being asked to do, kind of thing, um, and that's one thing that I do like about Brownlee. There is no conditions on his physicality, yep. run defense coverage. It doesn't matter. He's going to be physical every single time. Um, Kalen Carson, he's a press corner. I think he's an ideal boundary corner in a cover two, cover three scheme. Yep. Uh, non-conditional physicality is there as well. He was a guy that I was wanting there, but he actually went a few picks before Brownlee or before I was on the clock with Brownlee. Um, Chris Abrams drain. He's light physical and scheme diverse. Uh, but he feels like he's going to be more in the slot than on the boundary because he is light. He measured in less than 180 pounds at the combine. Mm-hmm. Um, Kalen King, that's a safety moving on. Uh, Nehemiah Pritchett, <laughs> the press corner with severe run D issues, or run defense issues. I have him lower than Brownlee, so I wasn't going to take him over Brownlee. And then Miles Harden, he's another guy, but I think he's more zone than man corner. Although, if Denver is running zone due to the fact that they have to blitz a little bit more, man, I'm all for Miles Harden with the athleticism that he brings. Yeah, I haven't seen Harden yet, but I really like Kalen Carson's tape, man. That's a good shout on that one. I, I have him a little bit later in the draft than, um, than where we're at right now. Actually, where are we at right now? And with this pick, the that was 106. Yeah, that's about the, the about where I have him. Uh, high end of the the fourth round, so 106. That's that's about where I would be comfortable taking um, Kalen Carson. I love the physicality. I love the length too. And like he's he's not quite super fluid, but he's got good fluidity to work on the back end and zone, and just the change of direction abilities there too. So that's it. That would be another good fit for this Broncos team. Uh, moving on here, Leonard Taylor the third pick number 121 for you. Um, we talked about him coming into the Shrine game, and there was poten- you were saying potential that he could be a top 50 pick. What's happened here? Why has he slid down the board this far? Because, I mean, I, I like the the penetration ability of him to be able to, to rush the passer. He's not a nose tackle, but more of a, like a three to five technique player. What's going on here? And why is, is there like injury concerns or something behind the scenes that I don't know of? But I, I don't know exactly why he's down this far. He's dealing with an injury through the draft process. Oh, okay, that makes that's sense. not that's not the only reason why he's he's slipping a little bit. A lot of it deals with the fact that he oh, was completely so. misused at Miami. They use him a lot as a nose tackle, mm-hmm. and that is just not his fit. And also, I really liked him, but the more I watch him, he's got an excellent ability to get so quick off the snap. Excellent get off ability. The issue is he's so feast or famine. If he doesn't win with his first move, he's done for. He yeah. either has to win right away or he loses. And there is so many losses on tape because he can't win right away against every single person. Um, the production is lackluster. There's a, there was a lot of hype around him throughout college, and he just never lived up to it. Right. You got another player we're going to get to here in a minute, and Mason Smith from LSU. And I, I think a lot of the same Real things quick. there. Go ahead. William, ask Nick where he heard that. Nick said he heard Denver really loves Blake Fisher from Notre Dame later in the draft for offensive tackle. Round three, specifically. Uh, that would have been from uh, the guy sitting to my left-hand side or my right-hand side, excuse me on this. But uh, <laughs> yes, uh, Eric Eric Trickle is the one that told us that. Eric Trickle told us that three weeks ago, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, Nick it, likes it, to repeat information I give him. Nothing against <laughs> no issue with him doing that. But well, yeah, I, uh, going back I to, going to, to the comment, is Denver does really like uh, Blake Fisher. Um, Zach Sharif was there he, at the Notre Dame pro day, uh, pro day where he was working out the offensive lineman, going through his core strength drill. And word is, is that he's a th- – there's there's some fandom there of Blake Fisher. That's the word anyways. 
that well, I'm, I'm here for it. I liked what I saw. I, I haven't done a finalized grade on Blake Frischer yet, but I did like what I see in terms of his movement ability. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot to like there. Um, back to the draft. We're flying through this thing. We got about 15 minutes left guys. We got a couple more things that I want to, to hit here. Uh, your next pick after Leonard Taylor is Isaac Garendo uh, out of Louisville, the running back. And I believe this is in, let's see, your pick number 136 here in the fifth round. Um, Garendo is one of my favorite players to watch the running back position. I know that you like him a lot as well. His high potential is a starting running back. But I was on with Carl on Tuesday for building the Broncos. And we were talking about the new rule changes and stuff like that. And obviously the kickoff rule is one that we, we discussed. Um, I mentioned Garendo as a possible option as a kickoff returner with his ability to see gaps easily and then get to top end speeds. First off, what are your thoughts on the new kickoff rules? And what do you think of Garendo as using him as a, a special teams player, the kickoff returner with Marvin Mims, just the kind of the overall package on that? So, yeah, I mean, he's got that good cut and go ability where he can plant his foot and burst out of it and pick up yards. And that is something with the new uh, changes to the kick returns to kickoffs. That is something that I feel like is going to be a little bit more coveted than just, you know, that straight acceleration and burst. Um, and he's got the good vision as well to see the hole and react to it, you know, plant mm -hmm. that foot and go. So, yeah, I think that you can do that with him. And I think that with the kickoff changes, I, I don't like Marvin Mims on as a kickoff returner that mu as much anymore because of these issues. I feel like that, again, you want that plant and go ability. And Marvin Mims is more of a straight speed guy kind of guy that he's going to outrun mm -hmm. you. And so you just can't. It, it's just not. I don't think it's going to be as effective. Obviously, we will see over the years how true that is it's just my belief right now data we don't have any of it on it right now at the nfl level so just just going with the feeling here yeah uh, eric eager from um or, no eric galco excuse me the the director of player personnel at the shrine game did a really good breakdown because he worked with the, the xfl in terms of implementing that new rule and now it's translating over he did a, a really good thread if you guys go and check it out I, I can't remember his handle i think it's at eric galco nfl something like that um he did a really um, good breakdown it's a long thread and he showed kind of the intricacies of what you could do with this new kickoff thing and honestly i think the offensive coordinators are going to be more involved in terms of creating schemes for the special teams coordinators to implement it with this new kickoff scheme because you with it being so stretched out and if you can move linear, you can create inside, like not really inside zone, but zone style running plays more than just straight up man blocking. You can do some pick, uh, pick and pull um, stuff like that. It's going to be fun to see. So real quick, Jeremy, we didn't pick anybody at 12. We traded down a couple times and, st and took Bo Nix. Yep. And then to address us, BK it is interested that most of the staff was at Mays Pro Day and not Penix's. They both were on the same day. Being both on the same day obviously makes it hard, but the Broncos were not unrepresented at Washington's Pro Day. They had their call. The director of college scouting was there, uh, mm -hmm. Brian Stark, if I remember his, uh, his name correctly, as well as their passing game coordinator and two different scouts. Yep. So they still had representation at the at the Washington Pro Day. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember because one of them was Peyton. It was that George Peyton's son, I think. No, that can't be right. Never mind. Uh, disregard. Moving on. I know that there was a, a guy named Peyton that was there. And it Robbie like Peyton, yeah. Peyton. I don't yeah. know. If, I don't think it's a son, though, because I think his okay. kids are young. Right. I was going to say, I, th I think his kids are young. Uh, anyways, this next pick, we kind of talked about it with Leonard Taylor, the third from Miami with uh, pick number 20, 121. This is pick number 145 that you got, I believe. No, this is one of the Broncos picks. I think this is one they got for the Jerry Judy trade. I can't remember. Anyways, Mason Smith, defensive lineman out of LSU. You want to talk about a toolsy freak kind of player, decent athlete for his size, good explosive first step. He was a lot of fun. I I did some watching on him after I falsely accused him of being an edge defender. He tore the combine to shreds. It was one of the more impressive performances that we saw out there. He's got all the tools to be a high-level pass rusher at the uh, next level, but you land him in the fifth round here. Why? What, what's keeping him this low on the board? Well, he is a traits-based project. He's never really put it all together, but he has missed a lot of time due to shoulder and an ACL injury um, in 2021 and 2022, I believe. I might be okay. a year behind on both those. Um, but so he, he missed time with injuries that, you know, that hampered his ability to develop a little bit. Um, so, yeah, it's just that he's long. He's he's got good athleticism, but it's all the traits and you just really have to develop the technique a little bit. Mm -hmm. The injuries 
haven't heard if there was concerns on red flags or not from the medical checks at the combine stemming from those or not, but it's something that you got to, you know, be cautious of a little bit. So just he's down a little bit because, you know, trade space projects, they're a bit of a risk. So, yeah. And then well, adding in the injuries again. Yeah, I was going to say the injury concerns are the big thing there. Like I was, I watched the Missouri game um, and watching Cody Schrader again was, is always a treat. That kid's so much fun to watch running back out of Missouri. But um, to Mason Smith, like he's got a decent swim move, but that's like the only move he has. He doesn't play to his length well enough either. I mean, the, the, the burst is good. He's got all the tools, but he gets sucked up inside a little bit too much. He doesn't play with enough power. So run concern issues are there for me, at least on my first look. So, with a grain of salt here, I, I like what I saw because I do see all the tools that, that he has in his tool belt, but you're you're absolutely spot on here. Technique is something you're definitely going to have to work with, and he has to get more physical up front, like absolutely has to get more physical up front, especially against uh, double teams in the running game because he can get this displaced rather easily at the point of attack. Um, I haven't seen your next two picks here, but you grabbed Tarheep Steele, a uh, cornerback from Maryland, and MJ Devonshire, cornerback out of Pittsburgh. Uh, I know you liked Devonshire a lot at the Combine, and if I remember correctly, he was one of the few players that didn't have a whole bunch of slipping on the field out there. Uh, edify us on what they bring to the table here and just how they help fill out this cornerback room. So it may look like I'm doubling up on corner, but I'm not. I believe one of these guys would be better as a safety, uh, which is kind of where I'm doing that. But the reason why you have um that I did look at corner and doubling up at least. Uh, McMillan is the final year of his contract. I believe he will still be an exclusive rights free agent. Mm -hmm. And he had a great year, don't get me wrong, but you kind of want to see some consistency there, especially with how volatile the play at cornerback can be. Um, what do we have in Riley Moss? What do we have in Damari Mathis? We don't know. Kind of rebuilding the room a little bit. Mm -hmm. And while adding to special teams, possibly replacing Traymond Smith as a gunner on it, which that safety that I got, that the, Pro the projection I have of the corner to safety can be a great gunner, and that's Tarheeb still. So he's scheme and positional versatile. He can move around and everything. I think he's going to be best as a safety and very physical guy, uh, unafraid, you know, to get in there and mix it up. Um, takes pretty good angles, pretty good quick uh, read and react to it as well, which is why I think that he could move back and be a, a sound safety. Um, and again, that gunner versatility that he or the gunner ability he has to help save a little bit of money from Trayvon Smith's contract, um, which Denver can get out of pr uh, pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And then MJ Devonshire, dude has a six foot six wingspan. Six foot six wingspan. Like, yeah, he's, he's long as hell. Broad, broad shoulders has good, has excellent uh, arm, uh, length, and he uses it very well. He's got scheme and positional versatility to play inside or outside. I do think he would be a little bit better inside, though. Um, so that could, you know, create some competition there with Jaquan McMillan. Um, but the issue is that he has, um, and this was, I believe, a six-round pick that I took a flyer on him for. He can contribute on Gunner, but he does have some issues against the run on defense. Um, so just just a flyer at this point. It's kind of taking on guys who can contribute on special teams and maybe develop a little bit into something um, for whatever you're doing on defense. Yeah, you have Tarheeb still here at uh, round six, number 180, and MJ Devonshire, round six, number 203. So uh, looking for tools, looking for traits, scheme versatility, stuff like that. Um, and it, it makes a lot of sense here. I, I was, I did pull up uh, Jaquan McMillan's contract. You are correct. Last year of his deal this year on $950,000 $950, uh, yearly cash uh, and a cap hit for him. And next year, he will be an exclusive rights free agent. So the Broncos can bring him back for a relatively cheap deal. We actually had a long conversation about that uh, earlier in the off season, talking about if the Broncos should extend him and do another, like a, a, just a short term extension before he hits true free agency. And it doesn't make sense to do something like that. When you have a player and you're going to have him still at cost control, unfortunately for you, dude, like, yeah, you're playing at a high level, but you're not going to get that big deal right now until you're actually up for uh, unrestricted free agency or restricted free agency, I believe in his particular case. Um, you're going to have to just kind of waste away as the, the bottom tier player, not bottom tier player, bottom tier cap hit uh, contract in terms of what you are actually making out there. Uh, final pick here. You have the Broncos taking on a player that I like to watch. He's really fun. He fits in really well. He's got a great run fit. He's aggressive, downhill player. Uh, round seven, number 248. This is a pick that you've got in a trade down with the Buffalo Bills to pick up another seventh round pick. Jordan McGee, the linebacker out of Temple. 
Um, a little bit thin, in my opinion. I think that he needs to add a little bit of weight, and he does over pursue because he is so overly aggressive. Is this a player that's going to potentially be one of those guys? Like, obviously, developmental player, seventh round pick, taking a flyer here. But is he going to have some special teams versatility with the new kickoff rules here? Because he's a heat seeking missile, man. He does flow to the football really, really well. Yeah, I like him on special teams. I think he's a better athlete. Um, you didn't word your, you didn't read your question verbatim. Uh, cause you mentioned the question, the, uh, the athleticism and the quickness and all that. Would you believe me if I told you he was in the 88th percentile for linebackers in his 40 time and 10 yard split? Right. Yeah. It just doesn't look like that on tape though. Like you see, you don't, you don't see it. Consist- you don't see it consistently on tape. No. Right. But there are, there are flashes of it. And as you said, heat seeking missile, that's him and special teams with the rule changes. That's part of the reason why I took a fire on him. He's not, he doesn't have ideal size for defense. He's short, six foot one, doesn't have long arms, weighs under 230 pounds, plays, I yep. think, I think he bulked up for the combine too, yep. to weigh in at like 228 or something like that. And he plays he lighter. Plays closer, yeah, I think he plays closer to 215, which would make a, unfortunately, he's not fluid enough, but I think moving him back away from the football a little bit as a safety might actually, like a box safety dimebacker kind of thing, that would be a really fun fit for him too. Like he's got decent enough range, but yeah, the special teams, the changes, the kickoffs, being able to put him on there and let him to go try to make a play. Like, yeah, I mean, it's worth the flyer. See if you can develop him on defense. A seventh round pick, you're basically taking a guy to try to compete to make the roster and possibly, you know, not just make the roster, but more so competing for, you know, a practice squad spot at that point. And uh, I think at that point, McGee with the athleticism that he brings, because I'm also a lot higher on McGee than this. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I have him as a as a fourth round grade. So um, yeah. I, I really like him and what he can bring, especially with the changes on special teams. Yeah, that was one of the players that you and I didn't really see um, eye to eye on. I remember you uh, – I, I could pull it up here, but I'm not going to because we're running out of time. But I do remember specifically that that was one of the players. I'm like, you know, what am I missing here? What Like what is – what's the deal? Because I have him a sixth round grade, so this is good value for – at least in my opinion. You catch him at the tail end of the draft. Uh, last, I believe, 10 picks or so, somewhere around in there. Um, and you have him as a, I think in your top 120, it, it, like it's a, it's a significant discrepancy here. I'd like roughly a hundred player difference between you and me and, and where we value each other. Um, I, I like the tape. I just, I think that the, the, the lack of size and the lack of that, that consistently utilizing his athleticism was something that really dinged him in my evaluation process. But I like the pick and I, with the new, like you said, with the, with the new rules, I think that's a great, great addition there because again, heat seeking missile, he does see it really well. And he like, he flows really well. He's a, a great player in terms of pursuit. It's just the over aggression can, can get him out of position at times and he will over pursue and then allow cutback lanes, which I didn't like that on this tape. Uh, Michael Ronquillo coming in here to round out the show as he always wants to do. Great show tonight, Lance and Eric on the Dove Valley Deep Divers. Go Broncos. Go Michael. Go everybody who joined us this evening. We got Colin Wood, Jeremy Sean, Doug Tessier. BK's been in here a couple of different times. DVA behind the scenes moderating the chat. String guy as well. Um, Pantera's a new name in here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, obviously, Scott's behind the scenes running the ones and twos. William Catalano. But we got to get to the people who helped support the show as much as they always do. And thank you all so much for this. We definitely appreciate helping to keep the lights on here at Mile High Huddle. Obviously, uh, Papa Bear McElrath jumping in early before the show got started. RD north of the 49th parallel up in Canada throwing $10. Phil McLaughlin, GLP, uh, Mike Ronquillo a couple different times. Thank you all for your support. We definitely, definitely appreciate and love all of that. Eric, we're going to get out of here here in just a couple of minutes. But uh, before we do, I got to ask, man, anything else you want to touch on quickly before we get out of here? Yeah, just a quick programming note. Next week, Lance will be away. Yes. Um, so we all can celebrate next week. It'll be a party here on Friday night. Um, but and I'm mad. I, so let, let me, look, I'm going to cut you off on this. I'm mad. First off, I'm glad to be able to go. I'm going to go hang out with my folks for, for a weekend. Um, a little alone time with me and my dad. I haven't seen him in a while. And um, just shout out to my folks. They're, they're great people. But this next part of this, I'm actually mad that you did this, man. I'm legitimately <laughs> pissed off that you actually did it like this. To be fair, to be fair, yeah. I'm joking here, but yes. To um, be fair. The options were limited. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. So next week, uh, my good friend, Luke Poglais, joins us once a year. We tried to get him on a couple times this year, but things just didn't work out that way. Um, he'll be joining us. We're going to be talking about the quarterbacks in this class specifically. We're going to be getting a college coach's opinion on them. Um, see what he thinks and all that jazz. 
Uh, it'll be a lot of technical talk, I bet. Um, you can hear it from a coach's mouth, see what he has to say. Um, I'm not sure all the quarterbacks will get to, but I think I gave him a list of like 10 quarterbacks to watch as well as finding t- the tape for him to watch all that. So uh, we're going to be talking about those quarterbacks. We're going to be uh, seeing what, what he thinks of them and uh, just having a great conversation next Friday all about quarterbacks. I'm How not new and fresh will that be? <laughs> well, I, so every time we get Luke on, we talk tight ends or running backs or cornerbacks because receivers. That's the, the, receivers, yeah, receivers, is big, receivers is a big one too. That's he's a position coach and he happens to coach tight ends and running backs and receivers and corners. So it, like it, we always talk about that running schemes and stuff was another big one we did a while ago. Um, it's, it's fun, man. If you guys want to learn about football in a great way, Luke does a great job of breaking stuff down. If you guys haven't seen uh, any of our stuff with him, just Google Dove Valley deep divers, Luke Poglaze, and you'll find it. He does a great job of making it easy to understand, easy to learn, and easy to listen to he's a great dude a really good friend of the show and i'm super jealous that i that you get to have the show with him and i don't get to be there because i i was really looking forward to joining him this year with that said we do have to get out of here thank you all for joining us on a wonderful friday evening it's just now 704 p.m mountain time um Guys, thank you all again for joining us. We love and appreciate all of your guys' support. If you guys aren't financially able to support the show in Super Chat Stars donations, we all get it, man. It's it's not that big of a deal. But subscribe, guys. Wherever you guys are watching the show, subscribe on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch. We definitely, definitely appreciate that. Like every video and article you guys see across all of those social media platforms. And if you love it, please share it and get it in front of as many Broncos fans as humanly possible. Because without your guys' support and appreciation, we could not do what we do best, which is cover your Denver Broncos. With that said, guys, we're going to get out of here for Eric Trickle and Scott Kennedy behind the Happy scenes. Happy Easter. Happy Easter to everybody. Thank you for that reminder. How is it Easter already? I swear I'm losing my mind. Anyways, you all stay safe and take care. Have a great rest of your weekend. As always, go Broncos, and we'll see you guys same time, same place next week.